we uh, we got to spend this time trying to finish up uh, chapter 14. Uh, we're going to spend today, we're going to spend Thursday, and then in lab, probably what we're going to do is check out, and if we have to finish up anything, then we'll finish up anything, but uh, hopefully we can finish. Um, we've been talking about acids and bases and what they are. There's two different definitions. Uh, you pick which one is most convenient to use in your situation. Okay? Um, an acid is something that will increase one of two things. It will increase in your solution the amount of free hydrogens present or else the amount of hydronium ions present. Remember, those are the same thing. We can count them as the same. Um, a hydronium ion is H3O positive. That means a hydrogen is hooked onto a water molecule. Um, another way to define an acid is using Bronsted-Lowry's theory. The first one was Arrhenius's theory. This is Bronsted-Lowry. They say that an acid is something that, well, doesn't just increase the concentration of hydrogens. More specifically, it is a molecule that can donate a hydrogen. Okay? And in a chemical reaction, it will get rid of its hydrogen. So it's, it's very similar but subtly different. Um, with regard to bases, Arrhenius bases are those substances who, when you put them in a solution and you look at the solution, you increase the amount of hydroxides present. Um, now, that's good and it works, but the problem is if you look at the actual molecule, there is a way to always increase, you know, with bases, they'll increase the amount of hydroxide present, but it could be, what if you got something like ammonia that doesn't even have hydroxide on it? And when you put it in a solution, where does that hydroxide come from? So Arrhenius's definition doesn't really explain that very well. So bronsted lowry will, you know, uh, will, will say, um, you know, a Bronsted-Lowry base is something that, instead of just focusing on hydroxides, they will say it is a, a compound that has the ability to absorb and take in hydrogens. Okay? So that's, that's the difference between these definitions. Now, with Bronsted-Lowry, is, this is, helps us a little bit more in terms of <laughs> keeping, keeping, tr keeping track of things. Um, yeah, for long, there's going to be like a family reunion that's going to come in, and they're going to take up that whole table, and there's going to be potato salad and a tub of Coke and everything over there. So. Um, <laughs> the <laughs> Unbelievable. <laughs> the <laughs> now I'm hungry. I'm just getting, I'm, I'm, get, I'm whiffing all this food that's going to my way. I'm getting distracted. All right. Um, well, what bronsted Lowry will allow us to do is uh, take a look at it from a chemical equation perspective and try to figure out what's given up to what, what's taken what, and that kind of thing. So that's where we're headed with this. Um, and allows us to look at reactions in a reversible way, like you know, back the other way rather than just unidirectional. Um, but anyways, this is uh, a lot of crazy letters, but um, the point of this is take a look. HA just means it's an acid. The A is, can represent anything. H because it's got a hydrogen on it. A B is a base. It's going to be something that's going to take on. Now, there's a cation that's missing here. It could be anything that's positively charged. It's just left off because I'm just trying to illustrate a point. So whatever ion this is can act as a base. In other words, when it reacts with this, what's going to happen is that hydrogen is going to move over and go next to that B. Okay? And that means that it has acted like a base. It has accepted a hydrogen. And the fact that that one gave off, this guy here gave off his hydrogen, means that it is going to be an acid by definition, by, by, by Bronsted-Lowry definition. So we look at the other side of the equation, and we see that that has happened. We see that this guy lost his hydrogen and thus was an acid. This was an acid. Lost its hydrogen. This picked up a hydrogen, so now this is a base. Okay? This, sorry, this acted as a base. Now, these guys right here are not... These are different. These are, these are different than what's going on over here, okay? Um, now take, take a look. I want you to notice that if we reverse this reaction, what, what the base has become, what the base has become is something now that has an H that can, in the other direction, be an acid. Okay, if we flip this arrow around, we reverse this. this is, these are called conjugate pairs. I'm going to talk about that. Okay? Um, all right. I'll show you what I mean. Conjugate pairs means basically this. What was your acid becomes your base. What was your base becomes your acid once the chemical equation is over. Um, these are called conjugate pairs. Uh, let me show you an example. Okay? 
Uh, let's use a, let's use a, instead of using these generic terms, let's use a real one here, okay? Here's formic acid reacting with water. Remember I said water swings both ways. It's amphoteric, okay? It can, be a it can be a base or an acid depending on what you're using it for. In this particular case, it's going to be a base, right? Um, think of a, to conjugate or think of like conjugal visit, or whatever it is that, that makes you think, put yourself in the right place. Um, con conjugate means to, to form a pair, come together, that kind of thing. Um, when we talk about conjugate acid-base pairs, we're talking about these pairs. Something on the right side that's related to something on the left side of the equation. Okay, now let me show you what I mean. Take formic acid. Remember how we said organic acids? This, this hydrogen is the one that's going to go off. This one is going to be stuck to the carbon. It's not going to be the, the ionized hydrogen. Okay, so here's our hydrogen. This makes this an acid. Okay, because of, of its chemical properties, it's going to end up giving this up. And in this case, you're going to see that water is going to act like a base. According to Braun and it will take in, an ad, take in a hydrogen ion. So let's look at the other side of the equation. Okay? If you have this guy who has lost its hydrogen ion, here's what you have left, right? CHO2 negative. That means this guy's out there floating around somewhere. What happened? It hooked up with the water. And when it did, it formed a hydronium ion. Okay. Now, what happened? Now, I want to make sure you understand this. This is the acid. This is the base. What formed on the other side? Your acid will always turn into what's called a conjugate base. And your base will always turn into what's called a conjugate acid. Now, think about this, and it makes sense. If you have this, and you have lost a hydrogen, it is no longer the acid anymore. Right? It has lost its hydrogen. Does it have the ability to gain a hydrogen back chemically? Sure it does. So since it has that ability, it has become now what's called a conjugate base. Now well, here's what you'll find. Let's say this was a really, really strong acid. What does a strong acid mean? It has the ability to do what? Break up very easily. OK, so something that is a very strong acid, okay, if this were a strong acid, and that means it breaks up very, very easily. So do you think that the attraction, the bond, between hydrogen and this anion is a strong one or a weak one in a very strong acid? It's very weak because it falls apart very easily. All right. So do you think it wants to pick up a hydrogen very well once it loses it? No. So here's what we're getting at. A strong acid probably has what kind of conjugate base? A strong one or a weak one? A weak one. Okay. Because by virtue of the fact that it's an acid, it falls apart. If it's a strong acid, that means it falls apart very easily. That means the bond that's holding this, this to this is a, is a pretty weak one. Okay? Um, so that means that it's very unlikely that when this ion forms, it's going to want to hoard back hydrogens and stuff them together and be a good base. Remember, a base draws in hydrogen and locks it up. So that means that a strong acid will have a very weak conjugate base. That makes sense. Look at the base. The base is what accepts hydrogens. This hydrogen went here to form hydronium. This went from base to conjugate acid. Now it's got an extra hydrogen that it can give off. It's going to be a pretty uh, weak if this was a strong base, right? A strong base is going to yield a very weak conjugate acid. A weak base would yield a strong conjugate acid. Now why would that be? If you have a very weak acid or a weak base, okay, that means they don't want to break up. They want to stay together. So that means that when, if the, for example, if this, were, if this was a really, really weak acid, that means they like to stay together. They don't want to break up. So when this does form, it's going to want to reattach itself to its hydrogen, so it's going to become a very strong conjugate base. So a weak acid will have a very strong conjugate base. A strong acid will have a weak conjugate base. Okay? So you should be able to look at an equation. Let's look at this one down here and figure out your pairs. You should be able to label the acid, the base, the conjugate acid, and the conjugate base. Okay? So let's look here. We've got water and ammonia. And according to our reaction, we get hydroxide ions and ammonium ions out of this. Okay? What happened? Looks like we went from H2O to OH. We went from NH3 to NH4. Somebody lost a hydrogen. Somebody gained a hydrogen. Who lost it? Water lost that hydrogen. So since by definition, if it loses that hydrogen, it's an acid. Okay? Now we don't know that you can't just look in the equation and assume the strength. 
okay? You, you can look it up and see what acids are strong or weak. We can just see what happens, okay? This could be strong or weak. Of course, we know that water is not a strong acid. We know that it's a weak acid, but nonetheless. Um, all right, so we lost our hydrogen there. Where did it go? It had to have gone to this base, right? So when you add a hydrogen to this, it's no longer charge neutral. You brought in a proton, right? You brought in a hydrogen charge. So you're at NH4 positive, okay? Now let's look. This is your acid. What did it become? It became this, right? So that's going to be the conjugate base. It's going to be the version of this without its hydrogen that it could pull back if it wanted to, okay? That's why OH would be the conjugate base. Now, what happened here? This gained the hydrogen, so it at NH4. Now this, ha this did not have one. It was a base that accepted the hydrogen. Now you've got ammonium that has an extra hydrogen, so it can act as an acid if it wanted to. Um, it's probably going to be, um, this is a very strong base, so that's going to be a pretty weak acid. Okay? This is a very weak acid, so guess what that is? Hydroxides are very strong bases. Those are the strongest bases we can probably get. No, not really. This is just written. Right. It doesn't, it doesn't really matter. It just helps you keep track of the hydrogen is the only reason it's written this way. Okay. Technically, of course, we would write OH negative because that's how we'd write it in a formula form. But this is just to illustrate where the hydrogen went. Okay. So, again, here's our reaction. Ammonia water. We just, we just looked at this one. Um, so here's our H2O and our, and our uh, notice what happened. It became OH negative. You see this hydrogen that was lost. So we can visualize it. This is a conjugate acid base pair. This was our, our acid here. This was our conjugate base as a result of that. So you should be able to label these in your chemical equation. Likewise, what happened? <laughs> Likewise, what happened was NH3 gained a hydrogen, as you can see here. So therefore, this base became a conjugate acid. So you should be able to label that as such. So you should be able to write acid, base, conjugate base, conjugate acid. OK, let's try it. Don't, don't cheat. See if you can do it. Identify the acids and bases and their conjugates. What's this? Obviously, it's sulfuric acid, right? Um, so that means by default, this would have to be the base if you know that this is a reaction, an acid-base reaction. But let's look chemically and find out. We went from this to this. How did we do it? We lost a hydrogen. So we labeled that as acid. We went from this to this. How did we do it? Gained it. So this guy's your base. So if this is my acid, H2SO4 is my acid. If water is my base, what's hydrogen sulfate? My conjugate base. And what's my hydronium ion? Good, conjugate acid. Let's look at carbonate, okay? Uh, hydro sorry, hydrogen carbonate or bicarbonate. Bicarbonate, we said, um, well, that's going to be something very important in human systems, okay? Uh, we have a buffer system that helps control acid base levels in our body um, that involves sodium bicarbonate, NaHCO3. Let's see how this works. If you have hydrogen carbonate in water, this is what forms. Carb I almost told you the answer, but H2CO3 plus hydroxide ions. So let's take a look. How did we go from here to here? You gained a hydrogen. If this gains a hydrogen, what is this? This is a base. That's right. That's just how come carbonates and hydrogen carbonates can also be bases, not just hydroxides. Okay? So this was our base. What water it must have been? We went from here to here. This was an acid. It lost it. Since this gained it, what is this now? Okay, you're right. I thought you were going to say conjugate base. This is a conjugate acid. That's right. We, this was the base, right? This gained the hydrogen, so the base turns into now something with an extra hydrogen, thus an acid. So a conjugate acid. What's this? Conjugate base. Now, <coughs> this is a uh, reason, let's say a reasonably, uh, well, this is a very weak uh, acid, so this is going to be a strong base. Um, this is actually a fairly weak acid, so this was probably a relatively strong base over here. No, they don't have to be. It doesn't matter. Yeah, it doesn't matter. Okay, good. 
Now, we discussed the neutralization reaction back when we talked about types of chemical reactions. Now, we, we look at this and we see that a neutralization reaction will be when you neutralize an acid in a base. When you take something that is a, a very good proton donor and something that is a very good proton acceptor, and the, basically their forces, of, of, of the way they act, cancel each other out. So that, you know, by themselves they could be dangerous. Whenever they're allowed to react with each other, they, they cancel each other's effects out and leave us with something that's not dangerous. Okay, this is a neutralization reaction. So, like here's hydrochloric acid in this picture, um, and bicar sodium bicarbonate, baking soda, sodium hydrogen carbonate. What do you get from the result of that? Well, if you pour those things together, or if you, even if you take vinegar and pour it on baking soda, you know that it just fizzes and fizzes, right? Um, why is it fizzing? Because of what comes out in this reaction. What actually comes out is sodium chloride in an aqueous solution, so it's salt water. What else comes out is the H combines with the other HCO3 to actually give you H2CO3, which is carbonic acid. Okay? But if you remember when I talked about these, in, when we talked about neutralization and gas evolution reactions, uh, anytime you see a carbonate locked up like this, what you're going to see a lot of times is a gas evolution. You're going to see the CO2 escape from that carbonate. Um, like in this case, you would have H2CO3. H2CO3 is, uh, doesn't stick around very long. Okay? Um, as a result, what will happen is H2CO3 will separate out into water and carbon dioxide. So what, when you pour all this in here, the reason that you're seeing what you see is because salt water is forming, gas is escaping, and also regular just liquid water is forming. Okay? So technically, after that, all that escapes, you could take something that could, you know, burn you, neutralize it, turn it into this, and drink it, and it'll just taste salty. That's assuming that you've balanced everything out. Now, if you haven't, remember, stoichiometry plays into this. Uh, there's got to be one of these react with every one of these. So if you don't have enough of this, and you just pour it and it fizzes, but there's still some HCl left, not a good idea to drink it, right? Um, so you have to think, there's obviously going to be some math involved with this, as we'll get to. So you've got to be able to, if you're going to neutralize this, know how much stuff to mix together based upon stoichiometry so that you get all of this product and none of these left over. Okay. All right. <clears throat> what will always happen, so I mentioned this before, but keep this in mind, acid plus base will always give you salt and water. Now, there may be intermediate things, but th that will always be true. Acid, base, okay, salt, and water. It'll be a solution usually of a, like a, some kind of salt water solution. It may not be sodium chloride, but it could be some other ionic compound that's dissolved with the salt. Okay? All right. There's generally going to be a double displacement reaction like we showed up here. This, like in this case, the sodium and the hydrogen would flip places. The chloride, or sorry, um, yeah, the sodium and the hydrogen would flip places, and they each have new partners now. That's a double displacement reaction. And that goes back to some of the stuff we've talked about. Okay. All the other chemical stuff that we've talked about in terms of equations remain the same. We still have to keep track of charges. We still have to write things correctly and all that. So that, that doesn't change. So uh, take this. We've got sulfuric acid reacting with calcium hydroxide, which is uh, like lime. That's what, that's what lime is. Uh, we'll give you calcium sulfate, which is uh, gypsum in like a drywall material, that kind of stuff, um, and water. So you could actually take lime, digest it a little bit with some, high, uh, some sulfuric acid. You could get um, sort of a uh, plastery, drywall-type wet, imagine all that like a wet kind of material. That's what would come from this particular reaction. Okay. Um, but this is a strong base, though. And the reason you would put lime like on soil is to reduce the pH. If you have acidic soil, which is, happens a lot around here, and you spread lime on there, what you're actually doing is performing a reaction. You've got some hydrogen ions that are in your soil, some, some normal higher pH, or lower pH, higher acid levels of soil. Um, you would want to try to neutralize that and bring that pH closer to 7, make it a little so there's less free hydrogen floating around to damage whether it's vegetation, water tables, whatever. Um, put some lime on that, they'll interact, and you'll actually perform a neutralization reaction. And you can um, sort of, this is just a salt. And, and water. So, you know, those, those free hydrogens are what's kicker for biological systems. That, that, can, that can be dangerous okay, if it levels get high enough, or at least it'll reduce yield and that kind of stuff. So, 
Okay, some are gas evolving, like what I said. When, whenever carbonic acid forms, you can see that CO2 is trapped in there, so that will actually evolve out. Um, just keep that in mind. So if we did the same thing with sulfuric acid, but instead of calcium hydroxide, we used sodium bicarbonate, look what we get. Uh, we would get sodium sulfate and then H2CO3, which then falls apart okay, into water and carbon dioxide. Um, okay. <clears throat> It also says, um, this is a little bit different because this is a little different way to think about acidic solutions, a little bit different way to think about acids. But I say here that non-metal oxides, so you know, when I say non-metal oxides, you're, something's hooked on with oxygen, but the other thing with it is not a metal, sulfur, phosphorus, anything like that. Um, and this has implications industrially, like for acid rain and that kind of thing, I'll explain. But non-metal oxides can react with water to form acids show you what I mean. Take carbon dioxide. You know, why is it that, first of all, with global warming, we know that um, <clears throat> the carbon emissions and all that kind of stuff gets trapped up there, forms a little bit of a blanket, all that kind of stuff. So we've got CO2 with global warming. But what else? Uh, in terms of chemistry, not just thermodynamics, but what about um, acid rain is becoming more and more of a problem. Now, it's not rain that's going to fall from the sky and melt our skin kind of acid, um, but the pH is slightly changing. The more industrial growth that we get, the more the pH changes in our rain. Um, but realize, too, that that's not just a local phenomenon. Uh, when currents pick this stuff up, the acid rain that we produce here in the Midwest and on the East Coast can travel all the way to Europe by the time that these currents are done and, and all of that. So global change, we've become a, a, a world um, that has become so uh, interlocked in terms of all of our, our global economy and all that kind of stuff um, and our rapid industrialization, this is spread all around the world. So the stuff that people are doing in Europe, whether you think it affects you or not, it does. And the stuff that we're doing affects them. Uh, and we need to recognize that very quickly before things get too bad. Um, but anyways, with increased carbon dioxide emissions, one of the things that can happen is the same thing that happens in your pop can. You mix in carbon dioxide and water, guess what forms? Carbonic acid. It's just the reverse of what we just looked at. H2CO3 normally decomposes into water and carbon dioxide, right? But under pressure situations and things like that, you can cause the reverse to happen. You can take carbon dioxide, you can take water, put it together and form carbonic acid. So guess what happens? You burn a lot of fuel. You release a lot of carbon dioxide. Our, in, our industrial plants, it would be great if we ever figure out this nuclear energy thing in terms of being able to, to get rid of all the waste, but we can't yet. We can make nuclear energy, and it's very efficient, and we can make a lot of energy from nuclear energy, these power plants and things like that. But the problem is we have this huge amount of waste that we don't really have a good way to deal with. So it's not a feasible alternative, at least right now, unless a lot more money gets focused on it and, and away from other places. Um, but the, um, we still rely a lot on coal. We still, we still burn a lot of fossil fuels, even in the industrial setting. So we're still cranking out a ton of CO2 into our atmosphere. What's going to happen is that reacts with rainwater. Okay? Um, now realize that by the fact that we are biological beings and all the other animals that we interact with, we all exhale CO2. So it's going to go up there, and rain will always be slightly acidic. It will never be neutral. And the reason it will always slightly be acidic is because we all breathe out CO2. There's nothing we can do about it. But there's no need to crank out a giant whole big bunch of CO2 just to expedite this and make it even worse. Um, so this is, this is combining. This is forming. Um, the same thing can happen with sulfur dioxide. That's a big one from volcanic eruptions and coal burning. Um, you, you see commercials now about like cleaner coal. Maybe you've seen some of these commercials. Uh, what clean coal is is not clean at all, um, but it's reduced amount of sulfur mostly and other things, but especially sulfur in the coals that they are burning to prevent this from happening. This forms actually sulfur dioxides that are made can actually react with oxygen and water up all in the atmosphere and make sulfuric acid actually in our atmosphere that will get collected and form an aqueous solution that comes down in the raindrops. Okay? Um, nitrogen dioxide can do the same thing and form nitric oxide. Do you guys ever watch, um, what, what, what one is it? Dante's Peak, where the grandma is up there trying to save the little girl and the jumps in the lake the, on, on the, the crater lake thing there on the side of the volcano and it's erupting and just digests her legs and eats her flesh. Well, that's a little, uh, a little hyperbolic. It's a little exaggerated. but. Um, the theory is there. If you have a lot of, uh, when you get a lot of this stuff spewing forth from the earth whenever, during a volcanic eruption, you get a, you know, a lot of this up there, you get some heavy acid rain following a volcanic eruption. 
Um, technically, it's possible, especially with this and this, um, you know, right around that volcano, especially, it'll interact with all the oxygen, the water vapor in the air, and create elevated levels of acid rain that would fall down. But in that particular movie, it was a claim that the entire lake just turned to concentrated sulfuric acid. Um, very unlikely. Um, you know, this is this is very low concentration. It's enough to affect us biologically, but not nearly enough to stand out in the rain and watch our skin melt. Um, so the the idea of taking an entire lake and turning it into to the, the concentrated level of sulfuric acid that can digest human flesh is, is a bit over and above, but it makes for a good movie. Um, the theory is there, though. You can see where that, that theory plays out. Okay. Um, now, acids will react with most all metals, but, but not necessarily all of them. Uh, gold, if you trust me, I can take a, a solution of hydrochloric acid and take your gold, assuming that it's pure gold, if there's any alloys that might digest part of it. But if you have something that's pure gold, I could drop that into an acid solution. You probably wouldn't see anything. You wouldn't see anything happen. Okay? I like pull it out, wash it off, give it back to you. You may not want to trust me with that, but it can happen. Okay? Um, uh, it, it just depends on, on the properties of the metal. Most of the time, you'll react. Obviously, if you take a piece of zinc or, or uh, aluminum or magnesium and drop them in there, that's a whole different ballgame. It's going to fizzle and spat like crazy, and it's, it's going to just put that metal into solution very easily. Um, remember James Bond had a had a little pen that he used to squirt on the iron bars to digest them that he walked out of. First of all, very unrealistic. Um, if you had, this is, this is why I watch, this is, the way I watch movies is a little bit different. Um, but yeah, well, I suppose you, you could design a container that would house like sulfuric acid without digesting the pen. But the amount of concentrated, because you can only get it so concentrated, the amount of concentrated sulfuric acid that would, it would take to digest iron bars on a prison is nowhere near the amount you could fit in a tiny little pen. I mean, he, if he had like a couple, like a 50-gallon drum of it, and he was sitting there spraying it, maybe he could get a little bit off of there, but not with a little pen. That was a little far-fetched. But it makes for a good TV, I guess. Um, and MacGyver was the greatest, man. Now, that show, that show was awesome. That's, give, me a little, give, me, give me a Hershey bar and a paper clip, and I'll, I'll blow up a town. <clears throat> Duct tape and bubble gum. I always get, there's always a place for gum somewhere. All right, so here, you know, if we drop magnesium in hydrochloric acid, uh, did we do this in one of the observations that we did? I don't know. But, I mean, you can see what happens. Everything fizzes like crazy. Now, what's happening here? Why is it fizzing? Why do we get this effervescence? Well, look, hydrochloric acid, solid magnesium. What is happening? Magnesium chloride, right, and hydrogen gas pulls off, and it separates. So that's, that's why all these bubbles are coming up. All right. Um, whenever acids react with metals, pure metals, okay, not a compound, but like you have here, like a solid one type of atom metal here, you're going to produce a salt, like in this case magnesium chloride, and hydrogen gas. That's always going to be what's evolved from this particular type of reaction. Um, so if you take aluminum and drop it in sulfuric acid, you're going to get aluminum sulfate, which is an aqueous salt, and you're going to get hydrogen gas as a result. Um, all right, now, metal oxides are anything that has like uh, iron oxide or aluminum oxide, any kind of metal bonded with oxygen, okay? So acids can react with metal oxides. What happens? When acids react with metal oxides, they, again, produce a salt and water. Let's take a look. Hot, sulfuric acid reacts with aluminum oxide. Okay, remember how we got these numbers. We, we can reverse this, bring it back up. We get three positive, two negative. Those are the charges for uh, those particular ions. What happens is they switch. The aluminum takes the place of the hydrogen. You get aluminum sulfate. And what do you get out of that is the oxygen and the hydrogens then come together to form water. Okay, so there's an example of metal oxide reaction. You don't have to memorize these. You should be able to see and look. Just look. When you have these things mixed together, recognize that it's an acid. What's going to happen? Uh, this is not a base, okay? Um, <clears throat> this necessarily, you're not going to classify these things as acids and bases, but it's just, these are just different types of reactions that acids can undergo. They can react with stuff. What will happen? What's neat stuff that happens when you mix acid with things? Um, you can just go back to regular double displacement chemistry here. This guy and this guy are going to switch places. I'm going pretty quickly through this, forming this, because you should already know why this is written the way that it is. If I'm going to take sulfate ions 
and I'm going to combine them with aluminum ions, you have to, at this point, already know how I'm going to put that together. I'm going to need, a, I know that aluminum is a three positive charge. I know that sulfate is a polyatomic ion that's a two negative charge. How many of each am I going to need to put this together? Okay, so you have to figure that out and write it accordingly. I'm, going to, I'm not going to go through that explanation again. You don't have to do that yourself. All right, bases. The only really type, now we talked about a bunch of different reactions just now that acids have in common, what they like to react with. With bases, really the only thing they share in common that's consistent from one base to the next is the fact that they like to react with acids to neutralize them and form water. Okay, that's, that's what they like to do. Um, but this is odd. Most bases will not react with metal. Most of them will not react with metal. The only odd situation we have with that is strong bases, especially hydroxide compounds, really like to react with aluminum because of its chemical properties. Now, <clears throat> you're not supposed to use Drano, for example. Well, you're not supposed to make aluminum pipes. You don't use aluminum for plumbing pipes because what would happen is when you pour Drano down your aluminum pipes, it would disintegrate it. Okay? Um, uh, Drano is sodium hydroxide. It's a strong base. It will react with um, the aluminum to produce a very violent reaction, actually. Um, this is sort of the, the whole concept behind the works bomb as well. Um, take a little bit of aluminum foil, wad it up, put it in a bottle, pour some Drano in there because Drano is mostly a sodium hydroxide. Let it set for a while, and boom, there's what happens. Hydrogen builds up from that chemical reaction until the pressure becomes so intense that the bottle explodes. Okay? Um, now, the reason that this is handy is because, you know, <clears throat> all the other stuff, like you could take an acid and put a metal in there and do the same thing, but metals are a little harder to come by, right? Aluminum's easy, it's cheap, it's in your kitchen. Um, this is why this reaction is more favorable for this type of bomb. Drano is really easy. You take aluminum that's really cheap and easy and you got a bunch of it, you got Drano that's a common household ingredient, put them together and you get this reaction. Okay. <clears throat> there you go, some important things to know. Oh, you never made a works bomb? Oh, you, yeah, you need to. Go home, take some, cut this out from so that there's no video of me actually suggesting this. <laughs> For, for those people editing at this point, um, take a, you can take a, a pop bottle, okay? You can um, you don't have to crumple it up very tightly. Just get it you know, so you can fit it all in there. Give it some surface area. Fill it up with Drano. Um, Drano has sodium hydroxide. Cap it. You can shake it if you want, but it's not going to make that much of a difference. You just want to try to get the aluminum submerged so all the surface area can react with the Drano and then just fill it way out in the middle of the yard and wait. If it, now, if it doesn't explode, don't run up there and be like that kid that, my firecracker didn't go off. And, <laughs> and run up there, run up there and try to grab it. That's, that's not what you need to do. Um, but it's, uh, it's possible. Okay. All right. Um, now, well, another thing is, too, like, I don't know if, if this applies to anybody or not, but um, like car parts and that kind of stuff, um, you want to obviously be careful about clean, cleaning aluminum parts because, um, you know, you can you generally put sodium hydroxide uh, in your part cleaner uh, to clean, like, metal parts for, for, for automobiles and that kind of stuff because the hydroxide doesn't react with the metal, right, but it does react with a lot of the stuff that you're trying to clean off of the metal. Um, you don't want to take a hydroxide, you know, a weak solution of sodium hydroxide, and dump in aluminum parts in it. They're not going to be there. They're, they're going to dis, you know, they're, they're, you're, you're going to lose some mass, or else they're going to disintegrate. One of the two, uh, if you leave them there long enough. Uh, that's probably not going to happen because these are pretty thick metal kind of things. But you're definitely going to, it'll have a reaction with them. Okay, so you don't want to lose uh, substance by doing that. Okay, now this brings us to the math portion of acids and bases that everyone is going to be so excited about. Um, what we're going to look at is a very important chemical procedure known as a titration. A titration is basically a measured situation where we neutralize an acid with the base. 
And remember a while ago I said if we use stoichiometry, we can figure out how much of the acid to use, how much of the base, and that kind of thing, and mix them together to make sure everything goes to completion, to make sure there's no leftover acid or base anywhere. And it's all been converted to like salt and water, for example. Um, and the concept that we use to measure this is titration. It has to do with moles, keeping track of moles. How many moles are there? How many moles do I need then? If I, ha if I know how many, for example, moles of acid are there, and I know how many moles of base I need to neutralize that, and I know concentration, how do I know how much to put in? Oh, it's going to put it all together. We're, we're going to take moles, we're going to take stoichiometry, chemical equations, concentrations, put it all together to have a big party with it. Okay? It is. All right, so what we can do is use reaction stoichiometry. Use what we know, one of these, two of these, whatever, to determine the concentration of an unknown solution. Basically the same thing I just said. Okay? We're going to be able to take, to figure out how much of something's going to neutralize something. If we can do that, and we can neutralize something, what we can do is I could, I could take something and give it to you, and I could say, all right, here's what you got. This is a potassium hydroxide solution. It's your job to figure out what the concentration of this is. I'm not telling you anything. All I'm telling you is that it's, sodium hydro or it's potassium hydroxide. I'll give you some stuff to play with. Figure it out. What's the concentration? How in the world can you do that? Now, if we could go down and zoom in and pull out each little piece and count how many of them were there, we could convert that into grams or you know, go from numbers to moles, moles to grams, convert it, get some kind of concentration, but that's ridiculous. We don't have that kind of time. Okay? So what can we do to figure out how concentrated this solution is if all we are doing is looking at it? Okay, what, what can we do? We're going to get pretty clever with this. We're going to test a couple things with it. We're going to keep track of the math, and we're going to figure it out. All right? All right, we would have a setup like this. We don't generally get time to do this in this class um, because it's at the very end and we don't have enough lab time. But what would happen is there would be a big setup. You would have a clamp right here that was holding all this down and you would have a flask down here and this is called a burette. It's the, probably the most calibrated instrument that we would use in a lab. It's very precise. It's got very precise markings on here. It's got a little stopcock down here that will allow the contents to be dispensed as necessary. What you will do is control You'll have something in here that you are trying to neutralize. Okay? You will let some of this out and keep track of how much of it you are letting out. Okay? Now, whatever's in here, usually what's going to happen is whatever's in here, you're going to know exactly what it is and the concentration of what it is. Okay? You're going to be dispensing that into something that you know what it is, but you don't know what the concentration is. You're going to try to figure that out. And you're going to allow a little bit and watch for a reaction. Um, if we're using a pH meter, you would stick it in until like the pH was 7. Okay? Or if you were, because that would be neutralization. Or if we were using what's called indicators, something you're looking for something to flip a color. It's clear, and then all of a sudden it starts turning pink. And then it goes away. And you do it a little bit more. It turns pink and it swirls and it goes away. And then that one time when you add that last drop, you swirl it and the pink doesn't go away. Then you're done. Okay, that would be, a, you've reached neutralization. There's special indicators for that. In which case, you look at the volume, right? Now, if you know this, if you know the volume, right, in liters of what you used, you can convert milliliters to liters. If you know the volume and you know the concentration, what do you know? That's true, right? Concentration, molarity, is equal to moles per liter. If I know liters and molarity, what do I know? I know the moles. So what I've just figured out is if I know what concentration was in here, and I know how much of it I had to put in to neutralize this, to make this reaction go to completion, I know how many moles I just dropped, right? If I know how many moles I just dropped, and I know the chemical equation, and I know like it's a one-to-one -one chemical equation, then I know that whatever was in here had to be like, if I dropped in one mole, that means down here I had to have reacted one mole. So now what? I have a mole. I know how many moles of substance are here. And 
I knew how much I started with, like 25 milliliters. I would have put in a specific amount of it. Okay? If I know moles and volume, guess what I know? I know concentration. That's how we solve this. That's how we're going to do it. I'm going to rewind one more time, explain that, then I'm going to go through the problem. Okay? All right, here's the bottom line. I'm going to give you an, let's say, uh, I'm going to give you um, an unknown acid. Okay? Um, you, your job, I'm going to tell you what the acid is. Unknown means concentration. I'm going to tell you what the name of the acid is. I'm going to hand it to you, and I'm going to say, use what we have in lab to tell me how strong this, in terms of concentration, this acid is. What is the concentration of this acid? Say it's HCl, okay, hydrochloric acid. I give it to you. What's the concentration? So you think, I can do this. I'm smart. I know exactly what to do. I'm going to grab this equipment. I'm going to hook it all up. And what I'm going to do is take some of my unknown solution that I don't know well, how concentrated it is, but I do know what it is, and I will put it in here. I know that it's, let's say, HCl. Okay. Now, I need to know uh, what I'm solving for is the concentration of this, right? So to do that, what two things will I need to know? I need the moles and the volume. Now, one of those I can't figure out right now. One of them I can control. What can I control? The volume. So let's say I put in 25 milliliters. Now I've got volume. I've controlled that. So I put in 25 milliliters of HCl right in here. Okay. Now, I know volume. I don't know concentration because I can't solve it until I have moles. Now, how, where am I going to get this moles from? I'm going to use stoichiometry. I'm going to use the reaction that I know. So what I'm giving you then to, to work with is, let's say, 0.3 molar sodium hydroxide. I say, I guarantee you that this is 0 0.300 molar. It's a three significant digits. It's highly, it's, it's highly specific. Here's what you have. You know the concentration. Okay. You know that I'm putting in sodium hydroxide, and it's going to be 0 0.300 molar, we'll say. Okay. Now, <clears throat> here's what we need. Bottom line is if we're going to figure out something based on stoichiometry, in other words, let a reaction go and see how much of it reacted and how much stuff formed, that kind of stuff, what unit do we have to deal with? Nope. What, what, can, what is the only unit that we can use when manipulating a chemical equation? Moles. That's it. So we have to, our communication between what's in here and what's down here has to be through the unit of moles. So that's our key. Okay, that's, that's, that's our, 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 our connection between these two situations. All right. Now, we've got sodium hydroxide. We've got point, and we know its concentration is 0 0.300 molar. Now, depending on how much volume we end up putting in determines the concentration, or determines, the, sorry, the number of moles, right? Because if I have 25 milliliters of 0 0.300 molar, and I have 25 liters of 0.300 molar, that's two different amounts of moles, right? The, the one with liters has a whole lot more moles than the other one. So I, what I'm trying to figure out is how many moles come in here. So here's what I do. I set this up. Here I've got 25 milliliters of an unknown concentration of HCl. Moles is the key. That's what I'm trying to get to. Up here I've got 0 0.300 molar sodium hydroxide I'm putting in there. Here's what I, I have to do. I know that if I mix sodium hydroxide and hydrochloric acid together, what am I going to get? chemically speaking. What two species am I going to get? I'm going to get salt water and water, salt water, right? I'm going to neutralize that. If I take all the acid and react it with all the base and nothing's left over, I'm going to have nothing but salt water left behind. That's the key. That's what we're trying to watch happen. So the way that we're going to do this is put a couple drops of, let's say, phenolphthalein. It's an indicator. You don't need to know that. Okay? I'll just put a couple drops of indicator in here. And the indicator tells you that when it changes color and stays that way, neutralization has been achieved. Okay? So I'll put a couple drops in here and let it s sit around, and it shouldn't change color. It should be clear. Okay? All right. So I turn this knob and let some sodium hydroxide fall in. But I'm careful. I don't want to do it too much because I don't want to overshoot it. I turn a little bit more. Then I go about one milliliter at a time. All of a sudden, I see flashes of pink down here. Flashes of pink indicate I'm getting close to the neutralization point. 
So I let it go a little bit more. I let it go a little bit more, and, and it's starting to hang around a little bit more, so I do one drop at a time. I do one drop swirl, one drop swirl, until at some point, what's going to happen is this is going to stay a very faint pink. It's not going to be clear anymore. At which case, I can assume that neutralization has been achieved. So what does that tell us? When neutralization has been achieved, that means I have correctly reacted all of everything that was in here. Okay? I've reacted all of the acid that was present. There's no more acid left to react in that particular case. So what I've got to figure is, if all of the acid has reacted, how much base did I use, basically, in terms of moles to react all of that? So I look, and if my level was up here, and now it's way down here, I see how many milliliters of it I used. Okay? This is, this is thoughtful. You've got to think it through. I see how many milliliters of it I used. If I know how many milliliters of it I used, and I know the concentration of that which I used, guess what I can find? I can find, well, the moles. I can find the number of moles. Now, if I know how many moles I just dropped in here, and I know that whatever that number is means that the reaction was complete, in the case of my particular chemical reaction here, which, which was this, HCl plus NaOH gives me NaCl plus H2O, right? Balance that, it's already balanced. It's a one-to-one -one ratio. So that means for every one mole of this that I dropped in here, it reacted with every one mole down here. So if I know, vice versa, it goes the other way too. So once I know how many moles I dropped down, I know how many are down here. Once I know how many are down here, I just take the moles divided by the volume, which I controlled myself, I've got molarity. Okay? Now, you might be able to follow that when I said it. Going on your own is a different, different story. But you've got you've to be able to do this. This is going to be a problem that you're going to see. Okay. Now, once this reaction is complete, when we, when we reach neutralization, um, this is what we're going to call the, the end point of the titration. Okay? So there's the drop being added, I guess. There it goes, very slow motion, and so on. Okay. Okay, so if you were looking at it in the actual lab, this is what you would see. Notice I said that you see these flashes of pink, right? You start it, you stir it around, it disappears until eventually this faint pink persists and you can't get rid of it. Then you can assume that neutralization is achieved. Huh? Yeah, in one of your neutralization reactions, I had you use phenolphthalein as an indicator. It's also, remember that demo I did at the very beginning yeah. of class with turning a pink? That was a, a, an ammonia a reaction with phenolphthalein. Phenolphthalein, see the reason that works is phenolphthalein is clear in an acidic solution. And as soon as the solution tips and becomes extra in terms of hydroxides, the second that, that it becomes basic, it reacts and turns pink. Okay? So you're adding, remember you're adding base. Here's an acid solution. There's lots of hydrogens around. The more you add, the more it gets full, and those hydroxides, when they come in, instead of reacting with phenolphthalein, they react with the hydrogens and form water. But there comes a point when all that is saturated, and then when you drop in hydroxide, it doesn't get absorbed. It doesn't react with hydrogen anymore. It just stays there floating around. When that happens, then the phenolphthalein will react with it and turn it pink. That's, that's how we know the end point is reached. So there you go. We've, we're bringing in this hydroxide. And you'll see that here's the beginning. We've got acid solution down here. As this hydroxide falls in, notice that it's reacting with some of those hydrogens to form water to help neutralize some of those hydrogens. So the more of this we put in, the less of this we have. The more of this starts to disappear until eventually they meet and everything has been converted. All these hydrogens have been reacted. That's going to be the neutralization point. So now it's a matter of keeping track of how many moles did we put in down here so that we know, and then we can figure out how many moles must have been present with the hydrogen to start with. Okay. This is what I just said. So. Okay, let's take a look. Here's what will help you. You may want to draw this, like sort of make a crude drawing of, of what we just showed, like with the burette and all that kind of stuff. It may help separate things out if these numbers start, the words all start running together on you. But here's what I say. A titration of 10 milliliters of a hydrochloric acid solution of unknown concentration 
requires 12.54 milliliters of a 0 0.100 molar sodium hydroxide solution to reach the end point. Don't be discouraged with the wording. Just break it down. What is the concentration of the unknown hydrochloric acid solution? Think about it. Make a plan before you ever start freaking out about the words. If we have a titration, you've got this picture in your head. Okay, you've got some sort of container down here. That you're going to be putting something in, and you've got some sort of burette up here. Okay. I can't. Whatever. It's not. It's not picking it up. Hey. There's no art in chemistry. <laughs> At least nothing that can't be computer generated. All right, so you got this situation where you've got something that you're titrating, you're bringing down through here, and something else it's, it's landing in. Okay, now the question is, what goes where? The titration of 10 milliliters of HCl solution, titration of, that means it, it was titrated against, so that means it's going to be down here. But if you can't figure it out from that, then look at this. It says requires this many milliliters of this concentration of sodium hydroxide. That means that if this was required, that's how much you put in, right? That's what was dropped out of here. So you can start labeling this. You know that 12.54 had to go up here with this. So we've got 12.54 uh, milliliters of NaOH of actually 0 0.100 NaOH. That's this. Then it says what you had in here then was 10 milliliters of HCl. Now we don't know what the concentration was of that. It tells us what we don't know. So that's what we're obviously trying to solve for. Okay. So the question then is, what is the concentration of the unknown solution? All right. <clears throat> How are we going to start this? Before we do anything, what we need to know is the chemical equation that's going to happen first. Okay. We need to know what is our reaction? When we mix together hydrochloric acid and sodium hydroxide, what is going to be our chemical e equation? Okay. Now, this one's an easy one. <clears throat> so if you take HCl and NaOH, what do we get? So here we go, salt water, right? All right, balance it, because we're going to need that stoichiometry later. Is it balanced already? It's already balanced, okay? but make sure, always make sure. All right, there's what we need. So we know that in this case it's a one-to-one -one ratio. That's what's going to be very important. All right, so we take a look. <clears throat> we know that we dropped out of here 12.54 milliliters, right? And we know that the definition of molarity is... Moles per liter, right? Okay, can we get number of moles from this? What we have up there. 12.54 mil milliliters of a 0 0.100 molar sodium hydroxide solution. That was what was used. Can I figure out moles from that? I can. Make sure you understand how. Here are three variables. If I know two of those variables, I can solve for the third one. This is the definition of molarity. It's how many moles you have per liter of something. So I've got two of those variables right here. I've got concentration, which is the big M, this part of it. And I've got liters. All I've got to do is convert that to liters. So I have moles. Okay, That's very important. I know the number of moles that it took to react all of the hydrochloric acid that was present. So guess what I know about hydrochloric acid? I know how many moles of it I have because it's a one-to-one -one ratio. Now, if it was not a one-to-one -one ratio, you would have to set up stoichiometry. You, if it was a one-to-three, you would have to, you know, take time, you know, divide by three or times three or whatever. Okay, but in this case, it's a one-to-one -one ratio. So, however many moles I drop in here is how many moles of hydrochloric acid must have been present. Okay. So now that I know moles of hydrochloric acid. And I know milliliters, what do I know? I know moles, I just figured that from what dropped down here. And I know volume, I can change milliliters to liters very easily. I know the molarity, which is what this is asking. Okay? 
All right, so let's put the math in there. Let's just skip this because I've already talked about what we're going to. I don't want to confuse you. I don't know. You might find these solution maps helpful. Do you? I don't like them. But if they work for you, then use them. It, it helps you. It helps you sort of abstractly more think about the problem and, and see where you're going. But other than that, I don't. All right. So what it's saying is, um, we know how many. If you look at the problem the way we had it set up, we know how many milliliters of this concentration of sodium hydroxide we used. And if we know concentration and we know milliliters, concentration and volume, then we know moles. And that's the point of this first line. We can go from milliliters, OK, we want that in liters, because that's what concentration is in. Um, now, this is one way to do it. To go from liters to moles, you can either just do what I said and realize that big M is equal to moles per liter and solve that way. Or you can use it as a conversion factor, moles per liter. Either way, you'll get the same answer. Get it to moles, whatever you do, get to moles of hydrochloric acid. Okay. Now, once we know moles of hydrochloric acid down in the bottom, then all we need to know is take our moles, take our um, volume that we started with, and we can end up with molarity. Okay. Um, so this is the math for all of that. Okay. Um, I'll, I'll leave that with you. I've already explained it all. You can go through and trace the numbers yourself. So final answer is our mole value that was used was this. Okay, 1.25 times 10 to the minus 3. How does that play out in solution? Well, we've got to realize that moles per liter. We used 10 milliliters of HCl, right, in the bottom. So that's this in lead, that's this, that converted to liters. So we take our moles divided by our liters to get our concentration. We figured out that the concentration of that acid was 0.125 moles. That's a pretty involved problem. It requires a lot of knowledge. It requires you to know chemical equations, be able to predict products, be able to use stoichiometry, be able to understand what acids and bases are, be able to use conversions, basically do everything that we've learned so far. Okay? Yeah. No. No, it's going to be all spread out over everything. Right. You're right. You're right. But what, to be fair, what, what I could do is just basically ask you things from the last three chapters and then know whether or not you've studied everything else because it's, it's all. But to be fair, just to be a little nicer, I, I pull some just basic questions from the very beginning stuff, like sig figs and that kind of stuff, so that some people could get some points on the test. <laughs> otherwise, otherwise I'm, I may just, I might just bomb everything. Um, but in all, in all actuality, you're right. I mean, I should be able to ask, like, this question, and if you don't understand, Adam, you don't understand the periodic table, and you don't understand charges, how to name things, how to write equations, then you can't do this problem, as some of you have just figured out, right? Um, but, like I said, I'll, I'll throw in some, so I'll, th I'll toss some watermelons every once in a while that you can swing at as opposed to just fastballs, curveballs, and all the like, okay? All right. Boost, boost your confidence a little bit as you're taking the test. Huh? Yeah, and that's, I mean, that's the hard part. I understand that. I mean, I've been there, too. I, I know that I could sit through lecture and watch a guy fill up a board all the way around the room and follow up, but the second I leave the door, I have no idea what's going on. Um, what are we back at? Study. I mean, you just, I don't know. I mean, I, all I did was studied and studied and, and studied some more, and eventually learning gets easier. I know that's not the best news you wanted to hear, but, yeah, I mean, it, the, the homework problems are designed to help you on the test. So, I mean, those, those are the key. Yeah. Well, there's a study guide. Yeah, there, I did tell you there's a shh, there's a study guide on the final for the final posted on my webpage. But what it does is it's not going to. I mean, those aren't the questions that you're going to see on the final. But it'll help you gear as to what type of questions to expect in terms of what kind of math to review and brush up, so that you don't just start at the beginning of the book and try to read the whole book before you start. So so go back and and say like I'll say. Question 17 on chapter, page whatever, you know, or homework question whatever, what concepts, look, look through that, 
see what kind of question you'll say, oh, yeah, okay, I remember doing this, and then go back and, and kind of do that. Otherwise, it's just going to be a ton of information to try to synthesize. Okay? Um, what is a horrible idea? It's past the point of rescue for some of you, but um, what, is, what is a horrible, I don't mean that in a bad way, I'm just being honest. The, what's a horrible idea is to try to procrastinate in a chemistry class. Okay? If you haven't learned that the hard way yet, and I warned you, adamantly so, at the beginning of this class, don't do that. I don't care if you do it in the other classes, what you memorize, whatever, but you will be sunk in this class if you try that. Okay? So you've got to stay on top of this stuff. I'm, I'm serious. Because if you wait, you're going to be done, and you're going to have to be sitting in here for the next semester and the semester after that. And sometimes I've, I've, I've got plenty of repeats. Okay? So I don't want you to do that. I mean, I don't, my, my classes will fill with or without you. I don't, I don't, I don't, it's nothing personal. I, I want it for your sake. I don't want you to have to sit through all of this again. I, I, I think it's great. I think it's fun. I would love you, to, I would love you. I would, I would love all you guys. I, I would love for you to come back and take every chemistry class possible, but we both know that's not a reality, okay? So I, I want you to get out of this what you can. Um, no, no, no. Oh, you do, yeah. I mean, it's, it's, I mean, I'll teach whoever wants to sit around. But I'm just saying, there's no sense in, there, there's a difference between in what you'll learn and what's nice whenever you get done with school is there's a difference in learning what you have to learn and what you want to learn, right? Because even with chemistry, you might find some of this stuff interesting when you're all done, but when you're not getting graded on anymore, it's a lot more fun to learn, okay? But at some point, you've, uh, someone's got to hold you accountable for learning it, otherwise you'll just sweep it under and procrastinate and never do anything. So you, that's... It's a double-edged sword with the whole grading process. I would love to be able to say, you know what, forget about grades, let's just come in and learn. But we all know that that will not work. For some of you, that will work. But for most, it will not work. And, and I have to hold you accountable for that. And that's why things are hard. That's why I have to do the things that I do. Okay? Um, and I, I hope you can understand that. And if you don't, well, I'm sorry. But it's, um, that's just the way it is. Okay, let me give a couple, couple more here. Um, I don't need to review this. We've already discussed this. What makes a strong acid and a strong acid? What makes a strong base a strong base? It's dissociation. And remember that when things dissociate, that's electrolytic solutions as well. Electrolytes are things that fall apart and conduct electricity. So obviously strong acids are going to be better electrolytes than weak acids. And, and same thing with bases. Okay, so that's that slide. Um, and this is a visual illustration if you couldn't grasp that. So. Skip this. Um, you know, we can use, this is just to show you in terms of uh, the ability to conduct electricity. If there's a power source over here that's supplying this um, and it goes through, if this circuit was broken and whatever the solution was, like in pure water, pure water cannot take it and move from this electrode, come in contact, pass that electrical charge between water atoms, pass it onto this, this electrode and out and complete that circuit. Pure water will not do that. It's, it's not dissolved ions. However, if you take a hydrochloric acid solution, notice the light bulb is glowing now. You can complete that circuit. Okay? It, will, it will flow all the way around because these ions will transmit electricity. Distilled, yeah, distilled H2O. Not like tap water where there's tons of ions in it. Yeah, there's iron, magnesium, calcium, you name it. Okay? Even some nice radioactive radon. Hydrogen sulfide, if you got well water, it makes it smell like sulfur and sulfates and, and, and iron that turns it all that orangey rust color. And, oh, that's good stuff. Um, yeah. Um, okay. I talked about weak acids already and how they don't dissociate completely and they only get rid of some of their hydrogen, so that's what this slide shows. Um, it's actually, in, you, you would be surprised just how weak some of these are. Um, most acids... When you drop weak acids, when you drop them in water, actually ion, uh, much less than 1% of the molecules are actually ionized in water at any given time. So you don't have very many at all that are actually ionized. Okay. Now, weak acids, because they don't ionize nearly as well, they don't conduct as well. So you see that this light bulb is much dimmer in terms of its glow. Water, again, for our control, nothing. Hydrofluoric acid, which is a weak acid, it stays intact more, doesn't separate very well, so it doesn't conduct electricity nearly as well. Uh, we have sulfuric acid, which is a strong acid in our car batteries. You know, it's got to be able to conduct around those lead electrodes that are in our car batteries. That's why they're so heavy, because it's, it's all plates of lead in there. 
Well, that's, that's, I got a lot to talk about for that. It, uh, we have, well, I mean, you can understand it if I explain it, but um, there's a whole concept of electrochemistry. We'd have to talk about different atoms and their affinity for electrons and how water plays into that. And it's, it has to do with some hydrogen replenishing, um, but also some other things. I can't talk about it right now. <laughs> um, okay. We talked about strong, no. I, I hate to say that because I never want to say that. I never want to say it just does because there's an explanation, but I can't. I don't have time. Um, <clears throat> set in the next semester. Take Kim 2 for the fun of it, and I'll teach you. <laughs> um, I'm going to skip over this just to answer that. Right. Now we'll talk about fission and fusion bombs, and we'll talk about all kinds of cool stuff. Radiocarbon dating. <laughs> you know. All right. I'm going to skip through this week's strong stuff. We've already talked about it. So we've already talked about why, for example, the conjugate pairs are like the way they are. Why does a strong acid yield a, a very weak conjugate base? Because of the level of attraction between the hydrogen and the anion. Okay. <coughs> Do what? Well, if you have like hydrochloric acid, okay, if you have H and Cl, hydrochloric acid is a very, very strong acid. That means it likes to do this. It likes to fall apart. So that means the conjugate base of hydrochloric acid is that chloride ion, right? Does it want to act, does it want to be a good base and suck back a hydrogen very well? No, because it already fell apart, right? So the strong acid means it falls apart really well. The base is going to be very weak. The, the, the conjugate base of it is going to be very weak. And that's what all this is explaining here. As far as acids go, um, really it's just something you just have to get used to. As far as bases go, they're easier. All your hydroxides are really strong. Um, and your ammonia is, well, that's actually kind of weird. Um, no, you just have to get used to memorizing, I guess. I mean, I'll, if you see anything like HCl, H2SO4, HNO3, some of these acids that, that I talk about we use in lab, those are going to be strong acids. Um, the only kind of familiar acid that you will see that is not a strong acid is acetic acid. Acetic acid is... Actually, uh, the vinegar is, is a weak acid, but I'll, I'll, I'll let you know. I mean, I'm not just going to have you memorize some big table for the fun of it. Okay, I already talked about this. already talked about all of it. Oh, all right, this is a good place to stop. We'll start with this one. 